If you're using casein protein like most people, you could be missing out on some potential. I'll show you how to fix that along with how to take casein protein based on my own lab research and one really embarrassing experience with a high level researcher giving a talk in front of a live audience. This actually happened, but there was a great lesson to be learned from it. So I'll share the story with you and it's going to destroy a myth that needs to be destroyed. At the end, we'll put it all together and I'll show you exactly how I do it with my clients and athletes. Let's get to it. I'm David Barr, and if you're looking to get bigger, faster, stronger, get leaner, go longer, hit that subscribe and then the little bell so you don't miss anything. First jumping into the lab, we studied something called muscle protein synthesis. That is basically the growth, adaptation, recovery response that we're all after. Whatever your goals, we're ultimately after protein synthesis. But there's another side to the protein synthesis coin, and that is protein breakdown. So we always have muscle protein being built or synthesized, and we also have it being broken down. So we can either increase protein synthesis or decrease the breakdown to get a net positive result, get more of that adaptation recovery response that we're after. Growth, if you're a meathead like me, it's going to be a combination of your protein synthesis and decreasing your protein breakdown, right? Because protein breakdown's bad. We don't want that. We don't want our body basically cannibalizing our own muscle, which is our de facto source of protein so we want to be able to provide the inadequate amount of exogenous protein or ingested dietary protein so one thing i learned from the lab was that casein for example has a very slow release into the blood casein actually clots in our stomach because of the stomach acid and it really slows down the rate of absorption now this is very very useful but it's important to recognize that this creates a slow release of the amino acids into our blood and this is not going to be directly anabolic and people often talk about how anabolic casein protein is that's not the case it's really anti-catabolic, okay? It's going to mitigate or blunt protein breakdown. And it's going to do so for a very long period of time, which is critical. This is going to actually result in greater adaptive response, more gains, as people will say. But it's not going to be directly anabolic. It's not going to be because it's directly stimulating that muscle protein synthesis response. It's going to be because it's blocking the breakdown or mitigating that breakdown, okay? So it's anti-catabolic. That's an important distinction that we need to make because again, it's creating that flat line of blood amino acids. You picture ECG, the flat line to show the death. You could think of it as the death of protein synthesis is the flat line of amino acids in your blood. It's not quite that dramatic, but it just gives you an idea that it's, it is more anti-catabolic. So if we're looking at taking casein along with something else, yeah, that might be something that's beneficial, but we'll get to that in a second. Just know that the casein could actually slow digestion of other things. So if you're going to take it earlier in the day, know that you're probably not going to be able to get the same rate of digestion for other things that you're taking in, other nutrients, other foods that you're taking in, especially proteins. Okay, it's going to slow everything down. We don't have separate compartments in our stomach or in our gut to allow slow things to hang out in one area and then fast things to digest and absorb in another. Okay, they tend to mix together and interact with each other. Okay, point number two. This one comes back to a really embarrassing story. I hate to say this, but I won't name names, but there was a high level researcher giving a talk and it was actually a talk at an NSCA clinic. He was going right before me. So this guy was a huge expert, absolute rock star. So what he said was going to carry over and actually have an impact on what I was saying. So it was kind of a big deal. I had a vested interest to hear what he was going to say. So he started off really well talking about sleep. This was a great start. He talked about the catabolic nature of sleep because we are fasted when we are sleeping, right? I mean, the body's trying to grow, adapt, recover. You need a couple things. You need a source of protein or amino acids and you need energy. Well, typically when you're sleeping, how much of that are you getting? Well, none, right? And that is why when we would study this in the lab, every single subject that we would look at, we would take their blood first thing in the morning and we would find that they were catabolic. They were in negative protein synthesis. Their body was breaking down their protein. So there is this confusion that sleep is the most anabolic time. I don't know where that came from. I believed it for years myself, but objectively that's not the case because we can't be growing and building when we're not providing our body with the raw materials and the energy to do so. 
So that's why we would always find that sleep is actually our most catabolic time. Now think about this. It's not just that the sleep being that most anabolic time is incorrect. It is the exact opposite of what is true. Okay, so this myth needs to be stamped out. Like we need to get rid of this thing. This comes back to the more challenging part of the talk from the researcher where he started off really strong talking about the catabolic nature of sleep. But then the very next slide, he started talking about how anabolic sleep was because we have low cortisol levels and high growth hormone. Now, this is problematic for a couple reasons, most fundamentally because he had just talked about how catabolic sleep was and showed the more direct evidence. So now he was switching gears and going to indirect evidence. And unfortunately, we know growth, growth hormone or GH isn't really the anabolic to building muscle tissue. It's more about fat loss. We'll talk about that in a different video, but it's not that anabolic and especially short term or transient changes in body hormones aren't really going to do that much for body composition. It's more the long term changes. So overall, this is a problem switching from, oh yeah, it's sleep is catabolic to, oh, sleep could be anabolic. Well, you got to pick one and the modern research, the more direct objective research is that sleep is catabolic. There's really no way around it. It's not a big deal because this is coming back to casein. We can mitigate that muscle wasting every single night by consuming a slow protein like casein. Do you remember how I talked about that slow release into the blood, that flat line? That is exactly what we want during sleep. Now, there is a trick to this. We don't want to blunt our fat breakdown, our fat oxidation, our fat burning during sleep. So we have to be very careful about what we're actually eating before bed. And this is the beauty of casein. Casein at 20 to 40 grams is going to block that protein breakdown or at least mitigate it to a great degree. And it's not going to hurt your fat burning, your fat oxidation. So it's a double win, best of both worlds. This is why casein is so fantastic and one of the foundational supplements that people will probably want to be using. Now, point number three, I get this one a lot. This actually is one of the most common questions I get from international students, in particular Japanese students when they come over and I lecture to them. By the way, translated lectures are just absolutely fascinating because they are about double the duration. This one lasts about four hours four hour nutrition talk. We have to take three breaks, including lunch. It's absolutely crazy. And just quick sidebar about the translation. Dry sarcasm does not go over well. I don't know if it's specifically Japanese culture or if it's the translation, probably a bit of both, more the latter, but just be careful with that one. So one of the most common questions I get from Japanese students is great. If we can combine casein, the slow protein with a fast protein like whey, will we have better results? And there is some truth to that. There is a study showing that there is actually a greater benefit to combining them than using them individually. But the subjects were likely fasted after. So that accounts for the difference because we talked about earlier, you're going to slow down your whey if you're consuming it with casein. And we talked about this in the BCA video, which I'll link to here or here, that if you spike your blood amino acid levels by consuming a fast protein or BCAAs, whatever, they're actually going to crash after and that becomes catabolic. So that's something we want to watch out for. So the combination of whey and casein might be beneficial for that. It's probably going to be better to keep them separate and then just follow up your whey with a slower digesting meal afterwards, two hours or so after. But if you want to combine them, it's not going to be the end of the world. You're just going to slow down the whey a little bit. So here's a three point checklist that you can use to decide if you want to use casein. The first is, can you find banned substances and purity testing on these products? And sure, Absolutely. For some of them, you can be sure to check the label because not all caseins are going to be tested. And that's especially important for athletes. Number two, how long has this stuff been around? Because most supplements come and go. Well, the good news is that casein has been around for a while, which is not dogma. It doesn't mean, yeah, it's a sure thing because something's been around for a while, but because we've had thousands of supplements come and go over the years, the fact that something has been around for so long, like casein, it's a pretty good bet. And that leads us to point number three, which is really the most important one. This is the meat. This is the real sex that you're after. This is going to be, is there proof or more specifically proof on PubMed for 
efficacy, effectiveness, and safety for this supplement? Most supplements, hell no. But for casein, yeah, it's really rock solid. It's not dogma. It's never dogma, but it is by far the best evidence that we have, the best means of making a choice for where we're going to spend our money, what we're going to put into our bodies. Casein seems to be a good bet. So there's your three point checklist. Now you decide. So how do I use this stuff? Do I consume 40 grams before I go to bed at night? It's the last thing I do. And it's going to have that steady stream effect where it's going to provide that slow trickle of amino acids to the muscle. So it's going to mitigate that protein breakdown, but it's not going to block your fat oxidation or your fat burning. And that is key. That is very, very important because if you stop fat burning every night, that could lead to a long-term fat gain. And we definitely don't want that. So casein, 40 grams, maybe a little more if you want more casein calories. And you can actually use casein anytime you're going to be protein fasted. So if you know you're not going to eat for a while, casein's a great choice to help feed that muscle for hours when you're otherwise not feeding. Now I will warn you, don't consume too many casein protein meals in a row. That can have GI distress, side effects of GI distress. You don't want that, it's not great. Once every night, not going to be a problem. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, you found it helpful, you probably know someone else who could use it. Share it with them. They just might owe you a protein shake. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell notification so you don't miss anything. And until next time, raise the bar.